about creativity in many places at the Oklahoma State University, or my very favorite place in the world. If you ever put my picture up there as Mr. Gandhi, you are a dead man. <laughs> We're going to do um, a little exercise on creative abrasion this evening. And what I'd like to do is take this row right here and make this the middle of the room. Mr. Henson, you'll have to go on one side or the other. And what everybody needs to do, you can do it up here, you can do it all the way back. But I need for one person to be in this chair, one person to be in that chair, all the way back with a clean division up the middle. Go. You can sit up here on the floor, you can sit on the floor in between, any other places you find. Mr. Henson. Somebody, somebody go in between those chairs there and pay them for the care of the way. There's a spare chair here. I can see that Misty and some of the others have a hard time with really detailed instructions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I see. Uh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we can all see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> uh, Okay. You have a thing on creative abrasion. I want to talk to you about creative abrasion for a minute or two. When you look at it and you see the definition, you see that the first part is interpersonal. And that means that you're going to be working with other people on teams and how you do creative abrasion, which will come at some point or another in the life of any given team, depends, actually forges the success or failure of many teams. When you look at the next part, it says embrace the dragon. Let me give you a way that you can know how well you are doing with, um, with abrasion. If all of your abrasion is interpersonal, and none of it is embracing the dragon intrapersonally, you're just a jackass. Okay? <laughs> okay? Sooner or later, whatever courage it takes for you to be confronted, to say, this is what I believe, this is what I believe, in, is a really exceptionally good idea. That same drive that you use to communicate that successfully, you have to do in the mirror and you have to do that with the person with whom you must be most creative in life in order to get along with that person. What's fascinating about creative abrasion, you'll notice that it says you need ground rules about every on the page. What's fascinating, if you look up the word abrade and you look at it in any of its um, definitions, and I checked out about five or six just for fun, what happens when you look up a braid is it says to wear down by friction and by erosion. Does that sound like an overly productive process? No. Which is why it is not with most people. Hmm. Gut check. Picture check. Metaphor check. Can anybody talk to me about a place where by doing abrasion you are doing something that is creative, gorgeous, beautiful, necessary? Standing a table in order to make it gorgeous and beautiful. One of my favorites is to take down about 400 grit and use nothing but, um, but finishing oil on it without any of the surfaces so you can see like a mirror across the surface. What else? You're abrading something, but you're doing something creative or gorgeous or productive. Sir? With landscaping, where are you abrading on a landscape? So you're trimming up everything that's already there, and sooner or later you have to scour the earth in order to put in your sprinkler system, in order to plant new pieces deep enough in Oklahoma sediment and clay or rock in order to have it actually be flourishing. What else? Carpenters. Sorry? Carpenters use abrasion. Again, send it out because the carpenters. Yeah. Again, what are they abrading? Yeah, they're cutting wood, she rock, everything else in the universe in order to make it fit, joint. Do the other pieces. What else? Ice sculpting. Ice sculpting. Exactly. You know, get your chainsaw and make sure, you know, did you ever think about this? How do you do ice sculptures when chainsaws 
throw out oil in order to lubricate themselves all the time. How do you do that? Do you ever think about that? I've never solved that problem. What else you got? Anybody in here ever drill for water? When you drill for water, you are abrading all the way down to a level at which point you have cut through the aquifer and having abraded all the way down to that level, you have freed it up so that the water can be pumped to the surface. It's a very abrading process in order to do that. Anybody here ever make bread? What do you do with bread? You mix it up and then you try and beat the snot out of it on the second time so that you can then let it rise the second time and the yeast does something even more amazing in order to respond to that brutal pressure and it makes a gorgeous loaf of bread for twice raised bread. Everybody understand the picture? So, gut check. It looks like there are places. There's another warning. The second definition for abrading says to wear some one down, especially spiritually. Interesting, is it not? So, if I have a team and I've done my HBDI and I know where everybody is in yellow, in, in yellow, red, green, and blue, who's my parakeet for the team to tell me whether or not abrasion is working well on the team or working poorly on the team? Red. Red, parakeet. It's the one who's always, how's everybody? Group hard. Let's get together. Okay? All right, here's the point. I want you to take a look at the definition um, with the person who you are across from. And you can do this in a synergistic fashion, or if you want to argue like crazy, that'll be fun too. But I want you to talk through what you believe are the most important parts of the creative abrasion definition. And then, in embracing the dragon fashion, I want you to pick under the ground rules which are your most needed ground rules because they are your most dangerous possibilities. Who has raised imaginary friend over here? Oh, thank you. The camera. Okay. It's me, Ray. Okay. All right. Let's start with the person. It doesn't matter. Just start playing. Definition, which parts of the definition are your most important and best? And under Embracing the Dragon, which of the ground rules are most important for you because they're your most dangerous points? Go. Okay, competitive out of five. Um, give me three adjectives to describe 
description of your call? I would say uh, dependable, thoughtful, and resourceful. Now, where did you get that off of that list? <laughs> oh, were they supposed to be on this list? Oh, on that list. I'm going to say you're part of that. Okay. You know, notice I'm being a little abrasive as I respond back. Just a little bit, okay? <clears throat> yes. Using the list and the discussion, which you may have just actually completed, rather than flirting, you know, what about the call, plumb our answers on the, on the discussion. There's no adjective. What she did was she tells you which points under the guidelines were important to her. And whichever ones of those she chose, those would have given you some pieces about her makeup and how she works with others or fears that she works with others. And then in her definition, in the parts that she may have chosen off the bulleted list, she would have revealed pieces of how she sees teamwork and pieces of how she fears teamwork. You guys pay attention? Like, in life, around? Man, this is club man. No, her. Let me go. Free pizza. It's all game. You know, what's fun is, when you're doing abrasion, that's where you're really up on the edge. If you've seen those HBDI profiles and you see the solid line and you see the dotted line, at, at abrasion, you're crossing over into the dotted line and maybe just a half a step past that too. Okay? And so under abrasion, you're looking at where your team works under stress in the HBDI profile. You're looking at what are the character pieces of somebody, not just the sweet, nice presentation pieces on their Facebook. Okay? So, I'm going to give you a skill set so that you can play with abrasion and separate out what's happening personally from what is happening in the project. If you've been in my class before, you've seen this before, if you're going to my class tomorrow, you will see this again. Um, I need a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, I volunteered. Mike, why don't you? Thank you very much for volunteering. You too. Uh, okay, this is called yeah. Speaker Listener. And Speaker Listener, um, we have four, and this will be the floor for now. And um, you will actually have the floor, and I'll be working as the listener. As the speaker, you will use short sentences, and, um, and using those short sentences, you will talk to me about why you voted the way you did in the last election. Whichever party you voted, I'm going to be in the opposite party. Okay? And um, while we talk about how you voted, we're going to talk about what you think the impact of that is on business. Okay? And. Okay. So, play. Um. And what you, I'm sorry, what you will do is you will pause every once in a while and I'll reflect back to you what I'm hearing. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, I voted no Obama. Uh, I didn't like his views on small businesses. So he wanted to, uh, t the way he likes to tax uh, people who make over $250,000 a year on whatever business they're doing. Um, what I hear you saying is that you voted for the Republican candidate in, in the election. And you voted that because something in your background ties you to small businesses and how the um, administration is going to reflect those small businesses. Do you find it interesting that in the last 12 elections, when Democrats come into office, that small businesses grow faster with the Democratic um, administration and are spawned at a greater rate than with a Republican administration. Yes, I would find that interesting. I do too. I do too. So tell me, tell me what else was, was going on with you. Um, I'm not going to lie, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the political candidacy. I voted a lot of based off of parents' views and uh, stuff like that. What are you saying is that you voted a lot because the banter that you heard in your house kind of reified who and what you were, mm -hmm. how you voted. You know that the single largest predictor of voting, uh, voting is, is, of course, it's not true in my family, but my sons, but the largest predictor is by 80% how your parents voted over, over time. Mm -hmm. 